looks like that. You know, yeah. So what was going on? But I can't say we suffered a great deal of repression. Well, well, well I guess you weren't doing well, things that yeah. were, you know, that were. No, that's all right. Well, when, threatening well, to when did you get here? How did you get here? Well, we came back this time to live, huh? to stay. Uh, in 78, 78, 77, 78, um, I hadn't actually been able to come back. We were living in Canada. We'd been there for several years, but uh, I'd been expelled in 71, I guess. And so I, I couldn't come back until after Franco. And um, you, when you say you've been expelled, you mean they came here and tell you you had 24 hours to get out of the country? Yeah? No, it wasn't quite like that. Um, we were living in Canada, and uh, around, I think it must have been about 69, 70, it was at the time of the Burgos trials. Uh, a group of of Canadians and Spaniards living in Canada decided to form uh, a committee and have a congress, or have a, a conference about Spain because for the first time in years and years other than little pieces like that and Franco went um, hunting or something that had always been the paper but there was no news about Spain at all but now suddenly uh, we kept hearing about the trial, uh, about all sorts of things. And, um, and so we did. We had a conference in, nine, I think it was September 1970. The committee was called the Canadian Committee for a Democratic Spain. And um, uh, the conference was called Amnesty. And uh, we brought a lot of well-known figures. Uh, people like Álvarez del Valle, who had been uh, the Minister of External Affairs in the, the Republican government, um, the Duchess of Medina Sidonia, the Red Duchess as she was known, who had already been well known, somewhat known outside of Spain as well, because she had led the fishermen and farmers uh, after the the uh, bombs were, uh, the nuclear bombs were, uh, had been dropped, lost uh, fortuitously, you know, in Palomares. And um, she, was, she was living then in, in Paris. Um, people like uh, Marcos Ana, uh, the poet who had spent 23 years in jail after the after the war, um, we were amazed at the kind of response. People came from the States, uh, the, the unions, the churches, uh, it was really interesting. We even invited, it was a three-day affair, and we invited members of, of the Canadian Parliament to take part because what we wanted to do was really to to stir up some kind of real interchange so that what was happening in Spain because a lot of things were happening in Spain then I mean it was really it was really the crunch when people were who'd been working for a long time here in the country we really were starting to get uh, support from outside and not only that but the people the empresarios in Spain, mm. and even people who had been uh, somewhat aligned to to the movement, to to the whole Franco's period, were realizing that they'd never get into Europe, they'd never be able to continue to make money and deal with the rest of the world unless things changed. People needed, wanted to change, but of course, to the degree that this was manifest, the regime. Oh, and so, um, the students, uh, the clandestine unions, even parts of the church were starting to get together and that seemed to scare no end, the government. Anyway, the, the conference, the three-day conference, was an enormous success. And at the conference, the committee was asked to continue to, to function, to uh, 
make known what was happening in Spain. And so we produced um, a bulletin, I think it was a monthly bulletin, wasn't it? Yeah. And we, we did a lot of other things. There was um, a subsequent conference two or three years later called Solidaridad, which dealt more with, I think we brought a worker priest and we dealt with the clandestine unions. We brought people, Carlos Elvira came from the uh, Comisiones Obreras. We then did a lot of things after that. We, we, had, we brought wives of political prisoners, a worker priest, uh, all the things that we could, you know, and, and had a lot of interchange with what was going on. Well, in the midst of all this, after the first conference, I had come uh, into Spain with an American film crew. Uh, there was a veteran of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, Abe Osheroff, who formed a film company. He'd been a carpenter all his life. A bit of a special carpenter, but a carpenter nonetheless. And um, like, you know, uh, um, Brigadista Internacional never stopped either being interested in Spain or stopped working. And he uh, got this small film crew together in Hollywood and then got me to come in with them to, to interview people. We had, as you needed to have, we had a, a, a permit to, to make a documentary about sort of generally what was happening in Spain but obviously we we keyed it to the changes that were taking place the building the you know all those kinds of constructive things it didn't mention politics at all and so we did have permission <clears throat> to, do, to do I had a lot of friends here in uh, because we had lived here uh, in the 60s. Oh, really? Yes. So you had lived here? We'd lived here in, in Barcelona for a couple of years. Oh. And so we, we had a, a world that was really known to us, and I had a lot of uh, contacts. Uh, but things were really hotting up in Madrid. And although I had names of people, I didn't know the scene as intimately well as I did in Barcelona, so I decided to leave Barcelona to the end because we were expecting any minute that, um, what do you say in English, a state of siege? A state of emergency. A state of emergency yeah. Yeah. would be declared because there had been demonstrations of, uh, I'm talking now about, this must have been January, I think, 71, of of uh, workers, of the clandestine unions, and the Democratic Students' Union. The church had also been, uh, elements in the church had been also very active at that time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I said to the film crew, we'd come in on a, in a sort of a van, a small van that we had, we'd driven down from Paris, and I said, look, you do any exteriors that you want to do and I'm going to fly to Madrid and see what I can set up before things get really bad and, and we can't do anything at all. So they went and did exteriors in places like Belchite and where there'd been famous battlefields and things in Jarama and um, then met me a couple of days later. Well, I found in Madrid that anyone who was underground had gone farther on the yeah. ground, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't it was very easy. Yeah. Uh, we did a couple of interviews and um, used to ship out our material every day. Uh, anyway, finally we were to meet uh, someone from the UGT, uh, which was still, of course, clandestine. In, at a street corner in Caravanchel and we were there and he was going to take us to a, a church hall where he'd lined up a group of workers who were going to talk to us on film. Um, we waited and we got there. There was no sign of him when I tried to phone and of course phoning 
in those days it wasn't like just going to a phone and saying hi I'm Gloria and here it was all quite quite different from that but I couldn't I couldn't make contact with him so we decided to go back to the hotel and when we went back to the hotel the garage was a couple of streets away and they they dropped me at the hotel and the crew went to the garage and um, when I got into the hotel the, the people at the desk who until then had always been terribly friendly with me and really nice said to me without looking at me no eye contact at all there's someone there to see you I mean in the beginning I didn't even know that they were talking to me oh. and and finally I went and sure enough across the the very crowded lobby which was crowded with uh, busloads it seemed of, of Japanese tourists were seven plain clothes men from the Brigada Politico Social and and so they they picked me up and took me and did they question you and in then oh you they or? really did yes really? yes yeah. oh, yes yeah. anyway after about 36 hours I was um, I was uh, expelled oh. huh. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, getting back to, to Canada, we continued with the activities of the committee. Uh, and then we came back. Uh, as soon as we were able to tie things up, we, as a matter of fact, we found this apartment. Uh, I think it was just months after uh, Franco died. We came back and we had it for about a year because our children were teenagers, they were in school and we had to find a moment to fix it up. What's more, uh, nobody had lived here for years and years and the space was wonderful as it still is but it needed a lot of work, you know. Uh, and anyway, we, we came back yeah. and here we are. Huh. And when you were here in the 60s, uh what 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 you hear? The two of you came from Canada uh, in the 60s. I'm going to let David tell this part because David, at this stage, David was making films then, but there wasn't too much happening in documentary film then, and so he did a series of of radio programs that he can tell you about. It it was interesting during a series of radio programs in Spain with a, a your uh, tape recorder. Um, it was interesting because I, I had to find uh, people who spoke English. Oh, this, that's true, the CBC wouldn't admit The CBC things. wanted everything in English. So I was always looking for something like a, a bishop who spoke English, or a teacher, a philologist who spoke English, or uh, an architect. And it's interesting, um, even uh, recalling now, People like uh, Uriel Buigas, who is an architect, uh, was an architect at that time, spoke very good English, and so I was able to talk to him. And the, the topic of his uh, uh, conversation was all the, uh, uh, all the things that were going on the on the Costa, speculation that was going on, in the, on along the Costa Brava, at, even at that time. And, um, and people like Murillo Aurelio, Murillo Aurelio, 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 Aurelio Campa Campan, 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 Jordi uh, Carbonell. Jordi Carbonell. Uh, uh, so I did find some very interesting people who became uh, friends and, and uh, colleagues later. Um, uh, a number of people were quite willing to have their names out in front. Uh, others didn't want their names. Now this brings up a very interesting thing. Uh, my my work for the CBC, I, I had to send uh, these tapes back to uh, to Canada and so forth. And once uh, when I took them to the post office, the, the guy at the desk said, "Well, what's this?" And I said, "Oh, it's a, a tape I'm sending back to my friends or half family in Canada." But the the interesting thing uh, at that time was that Spain was still, people were still gripped with fear. Fear was the most evident uh, emotion. Nobody 
uh, in general, uh, forgetting about the people I, I, I spoke to, but in general, people would not talk about anything related to politics. Yeah. There was an absolute gap. And that is the interesting thing, I think, about the, the transition. Um, it was a time when that fear was gone. You could, you could talk. Uh, so uh, the, the, the transition meant the, the, the disappearance of con political control by the army, for example. Um, it meant that you could talk uh, because there was the democratic system uh, and, and people could have some voice. Now, I, I think that uh, there were some uh, things missing in, in all that uh, transition period. Um, and, and I think we, we still today find that there are, there are some gaps. For example, uh, this recent case where uh, a, a young uh, immigrant was kicked and beaten in, in the subway in Barcelona and, and the, and the uh, aggressor was allowed to go free basically. Um, and, and this has caused quite a ruckus in the, in, within the legal system. But it, 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 it shows that the legal system has not been made good and ready uh, for the democratic system that now exists in Spain. And no, there's also been no reconciliation process. For instance, the police that, plain clothes police that might have taken you back to the Comisario for 36 hours and giving you a whole lot of grief uh, for what they perceived as your political wrong, they didn't have to pay for it later on, did they? No, oh, no, 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 they no. didn't. As a matter of and fact, I was the one who really had to pay for it because I wasn't. Transition. Ah, no, 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 not Which, at all. And there were no a lot of cases. One of the things that that you've said, though, that I, you know, I, I agree with what you've said, but the fear. It's interesting, when we came back, we knew Spain very well. We knew, you know, we'd been coming here since the, the 50s, uh, going, coming to, to Barcelona, going to Asturias, where my family lives. Then you would notice, and particularly in Asturias, in a small mining town, uh, how the fear People then wouldn't talk. There was only one person in my family who would talk, and the others would all, all felt that he talked too much, too much. <laughs> Something was going to happen to him. He talked much too much, you know. But people, you would ask because we were ripe for for knowing uh, and imagined that within a family that people would talk, but they had suffered too much there. People wouldn't say anything. But the, the point that I'm wanting to make is, when we came back, if you had said to me then, what kind of legacy do 40 years of, of you know, Frankism, what, what, what does that leave? I would have given you all the, the arguments you probably would have given yourself. But it goes way beyond that. I found that ordinary people were afraid of the most ordinary things. No one wanted to rock the boat at any level. It didn't have to be politics at all. Uh, I can remember certain things, for instance, when we were fixing this house. Our neighbors, wonderful neighbors, few of them, because we only have one apartment on each floor, had lived here for years and years and years. Uh, they were older than we were, and um, we had a very good relationship with them. And when we did anything in the house, in the staircase, we were very careful to to have them as part of the decision making and everything. And they were terrified. You do this, and you'll be in trouble for painting the, the staircase. <clears throat> You can't do this without getting a letter from my, you know, and we'd say we'd spoken to the administration, we'd done, you know, everything. People were really frightened, felt that they would somehow be tossed out, you know. That was the biggest lesson to me. I mean, it was scary, eh, because then you, then you realize at the level of a country, 
what those years have done and how many years it's going to take to eradicate that, you know? On, on a brighter note, I remember uh, one of the small things that happened on the streets after the change to a democratic system here. I remember I was standing on, I was going along the uh, streets and I came to the corner of uh, Balmas and Granvia and there was a workman uh, breaking up the street sign which then read Avenida Jose, uh, Ant uh, Jose Antonio. Um, and um, there was a man, a fairly elderly man who must have known all of the years of the Frankist reg uh, regime, was watching him doing this. And I stopped to watch the man who was watching the man who was fixing up the thing. But to me that was a, a moment uh, l like a photographic moment uh, of change uh, because it, it was uh, he was a, a, an ordinary workman breaking up part of what w was a symbol of the, of the Franco regime and, and, and the man who was standing watching him was standing there witnessing this change to me that was an incredible moment Sorry about That's that. All right. <laughs> you want to get it? I once told me a while ago, I said that everybody, we used to keep kerosene in, 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 in uh, gaseosa bottles. That's how they would fill up your gaseosa bottle with kerosene. We had just kerosene lamps, we had just, and it was illegal. And somebody once explained to me that everybody in Spain did something illegal. And it was so that if the Guardia ever wanted to come and talk to you for any reason, there was always something that you were doing. <laughs> I, I never yeah. heard of that. That's yeah. a good story. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, well, yeah. and that'll generate some fear, boy, really, when it comes yeah. down to it, you know. No, there, all those years of... Uh, it, it's interesting, eh, because we... Oh, when I think back to what was going on politically, and I guess we were very close to what was going on politically, and working quite actively with, with the resistance from 69, 70 on, right through. Even sometimes, and I'm, I'm the first to do it, I'll, I'll complain and say, as we were just saying, that there wasn't the break that we all wanted and that we all thought must happen, finally. Uh, but, you know, when you really think back to what was going on then, it's kind of a miracle that we were able to maneuver it. And I really don't know uh, if thinking politically, if it would have been possible at that moment to have had the break without something really very dramatic happening. The, the interesting thing is that the change, let's be honest, has been enormous. The, the, there is no, no other way to describe it. Now, that doesn't mean that there were not some compromises, like people can point to the compromises. I don't necessarily say I'm pointing to them, but often these are brought up. Like, the monarchy was a compromise. Uh, the uh, continuation of the present legal system was a compromise. It's still not working. The, the arrangements between church and state uh, are, are doubtful, but they still exist. These, there are a number of things like that. Uh, the, the whole is of how you deal with uh, the Basque prisoners. Uh, uh, there are many people in, in, in the Basque country who feel those prisoners of ETA, uh, prison, ETA prisoners should be brought back to the Basque country. There are, there are many things that, uh, that are still to be done, but, yeah, but overall it's no, no, been it's, an enormous change. But you know, one of the other things too is that when we talk about, and, and I do as I, you know, I repeat that I do think it's, it's kind of a miracle that we were able to maneuver 
as has happened, so that we have the kind of Spain that we have now. Uh, but the transition was very difficult. There were people who were killed. There were workers who were on strike who were killed. It was a torture, for there, example. And then a torture happened, you know. The, the thing that, that we're, I think, often inclined to forget is that the extreme right was, was really standing up and felt very strong. And, and that, that made things very difficult because uh, it made things difficult, I'm sure, for the people in the government who were trying to, who realized that there was a transition needed, that we needed to get to a different uh, uh, state, that we needed to yeah. have democracy. And then the people on the left also who were pushing had to, to compromise along the way, yeah. realizing the forces they were up against. So it, it was an extremely difficult time, eh? uh, a dramatic time, a dramatic time. I mean, you know, when we were still in Canada, we had, um, for instance, when uh, the Assemblée de, de Catalonia, when, when uh, you know, all of those uh, intellectuals were uh, jailed, was that at the time of the Assemblée or was it that at the time of the... Um, the Caravanchel day, uh, 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 was assembly, it the assembly? Okay. Yeah. In, in, in any case, in Montserrat, you know, uh, what we did was we had that brought up in the Canadian Parliament, and a vote was taken on it. There were a lot of things like that. Even when El Juglas with La Torna had their problems, we had a big uh, campaign from theatres and theatre people in Canada you know, writing to the government in support. There were a lot of things that you could do. Then, when we were here in 1979, the um, veterans of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the internationals, of, of the Canadian veterans, and Canada had a very big contingent in the Spanish Civil War, given its population. I think it was one of the biggest in proportion to, to the size of the population. Anyway, the MACPAPs, as they're called, from the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion, wrote to us and said, we are going to come back now, and we want you to arrange uh, a tour for us. So David and I arranged this tour, you know, all around the battlefields, all the, everything, you know, to the jails where some of them had been kept. That was very, very moving, because then uh, the unions here, they, all the, the progressive elements here were ready to, to help and to, well, you know, um, ex-prisoners here, the Association of Ex-Prisoners, the uh, Aviadores de la Republic, uh, all sorts of people. And uh, we traveled around with them in a bus. There must have been about 40 of them. They were already, I mean, it's going back a long time, but they were already aged, elderly. you know, elderly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was so moving to see ordinary people on the street there they were with their boinas and, and their, you know, little medals and their signs of the international brigades and people recognized them. And when they knew, it was incredible, the, the, the warmth, the, the gratitude of people. Um, one of them, it's interesting, our son Miguel was part of the film crew that came from Canada that was covering the, the, the whole tour. And... Uh, he was in Teruel. David and I didn't happen to be with them there. We had to come back to Barcelona and met them again later on. But uh, one of them died in Teruel, where he had fought during the war. And I have a feeling that there were difficulties in his being shipped back, that the family decided that he'd be buried there. It was very dramatic. Miguel was, I think, 16 at the time, and he was... Quite moving. It was quite moving for him, you know. But there were things like that that happened. I can remember in the, the first years, too, as we live here right in the center of the city, and I work at home, that I finally had to say to myself, okay, basta ya. 
because there were so many popular festivals that were starting up again and that were getting going and you wanted to be part of them all and you were always in the street going to this and going to that and it took up an awful lot of time but it was wonderful it was it really was a whole new world it, it must have been a great exuberance in a sense that anything was possible and one of those moments in which people collectively feel like Anything is possible. Truly. Or is it weight all of a sudden taken off? That is exactly what it was, I think, of weight taken off and, and the feeling that that you could do anything. anything. Now, mind you, I didn't know to remember how long it took us to realize that we weren't quite doing anything. And, and often I would think of the years before and the speeches I'd made and the things I'd said and the feelings that we had that, you know, we were really going to push through to the very end. Well, we haven't been able to do that, but not yet. But, but what we've had, have now is really, it's marvelous. Yeah. It's marvelous. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, think it's right. I mean, the fact that when things aren't what we feel they should be, uh, we can stand up and and yell and say something about it and complain. And Doesn't complain. Yeah. The thing is, before, that you could not complain. Yeah. Today, you can. Mm -hmm. right. where, where were you guys when uh, Franco died, on the day he died? Oh, well, that's a very interesting story, too. Uh, the committee, by then, had been going, I guess, for five, six, seven years. And we fi found that then it was time to end the committee, because what we'd set up to do, really, uh, had been done. That's a nice feeling. I've never been part of a committee where you could finish the committee and say th this was the end. Anyway, on this particular day, we were to hand over the papers. In Canada. Yeah, in Canada. We decided that the papers should go to the, the Central Library, to the John Roberts Library, uh, to the Thomas Fisher Rare Books Room. That was part of the University of Toronto. That was part, yes. Still is because we thought if ever anyone wants to study this part of, of Canadian history, here it is, you know, because we had a lot of things. We also managed to get, when uh, this was added to a, a collection of some 600 books on the Spanish Civil War, and there were further editions being made, so that is all there with the name of the Canadian Committee for Democratic Spain, uh, deposit. Spanish Civil War collection. Seventh Spanish Civil War collection, yeah. And uh, anyway, the very day that I was to officially, on behalf of the committee, hand this over, Franco dies. So this is what we were told, that Franco had died. And so I get a call from the library, from the university, to say, Gloria, we've heard the news, but of course you won't make any mention of this when you, you, you know, give the books over because this is not a political event, you understand that. Well, it was absolutely important. Of course we mentioned it, you know, we tried to turn it down, but there were, there were you know, Briodistas there, but there were people from the unions, there were people from the committee, there were people all around, you it know. It was a very and exciting it, moment. However, I believe that we found out that he hadn't indeed died that day. And it was, I think there it were was about three parties that were held to celebrate his death. To celebrate. But it was held over until the 20th of November. Ah. Yes. Ah. Anyway, so there was a, there was a celebration at home and it wasn't oh it, when you say there was a celebration when anyone dies it doesn't yeah. sound so good but what we were celebrating was what a whole lot of people for so many years had suffered uh, and, and the, the end, end of the that, end of all that. Yeah. you know and when you came back over did you find uh, for instance one of the things I want to concentrate on in this project is uh, women's roles in the transition and did you, from having been in the 60s, say, and you knew Spanish, what mm. a Spanish woman, what position she was supposed to occupy in a Spanish family, 
did, were you aware that that was one of the elements that was changing during the transition? Was there was that something that was clear and in front of everything? Yeah, that was that was something. I think there were always people like uh, here, like Capmani, like. Um, Lilia Falcon, like they were always, they were feminists who were very active. But here, as in Canada, as anywhere, um, it, you know, attitudes take a long time to change. I mean, look now, we're, we're years and years into it. We have laws that that uh, protect women's rights, you might say, but attitudes take a long, long time to, I think the laws are important uh, because without that the attitudes don't even have to change, don't begin to change. But uh, no, no, we were, you know, it, it was all part of, of Spain finally, like coming into the 20th century and, you know, the 20th century was in its, in its last quarter, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But the other thing was there were a lot of people, very few people had traveled then. And now, look, today, people are traveling all the time, and that makes a difference to what people realize about the world, what they realize about themselves, the possibilities that they know about. Huh? You know, we, we all, we're all very similar, and uh, we... We need help along the way. Yeah, we need, you know, to know that we're not the only ones that are trying to to make things better. Yeah, that's right. yeah. and and that was, for instance, telephones and traffic and all of those kinds of things in the '60s. I don't know how it was here in Formentera. You had to go to a locutorio to use it, like for an immigrant today. Here, you had to use the wait line up and use a phone, and the lines didn't always work, and. The, there was not much traffic, you know, there were only, say, our 600s. And, uh, but the thing I remember most about that, I don't, I, I just remember the streets even not being, I mean, it was nothing like Barcelona today, particularly here on the Ramblas, you know, my God, you, know, you can hardly walk. I do remember seeing once on Paseo de Gracia, now maybe I'm going back to, I don't know if it was the 50s or 60s, uh, a black man and he nearly stopped traffic. You know, it was just so unusual, so unusual. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And I remember when we went first in the 50s to Asturias, and my family lived in the Cuenca Minera, in a, in a small town, and David had a beard, even then, and kids used to come to the window, poke their faces, Mira, Angelina tiene un chico yeye en casa. That was the big thing, un chico yeye, no, en casa. And kids would follow us along the street and they had never seen anyone with a beard. Isn't it funny? I mean, that was, all that was kind of new and shocking to us. There were other things too. Um, later on, now I'm into the 60s, I guess. If you would go from Barcelona to Bilbao, Hmm? You'd have to go to Madrid, and then you'd go to Bilbao. And it, it's a little bit like what you were saying before, how people were, like the plane, you would have all your luggage on the plane, and then suddenly you'd be told that the plane wasn't flying. And it was beautiful weather in Madrid, say. And you'd ask, why is the plane not going? Well, because of weather conditions. You know, and it was all very, very vague, and this was very, very common. Eh? Yeah. And people would be there, no one would complain, and you'd have to wait and get your luggage back, and you'd have to go back to get a hotel. or do. And the same thing I remember happened to us on that trip in Bilbao. You had Again. to accept what yeah. was handed out. Yeah. yeah, no one protested. No. No. no one got angry. Now, no. another interesting thing, and I can't... Be, I can't verify what this was, but it was a time where, again, when the plane going to Bilbao uh, hadn't been able to go. This happened to us several times, okay, and weather conditions, technical problems. You know? And when the plane finally went the next day, uh, there was a man in plain clothes who got on and sat at the back 
and he held what looked like a submachine gun which was covered with a yellow towel. Now, I can't explain anything more than that, and I know it sounds ridiculous, it sounds absolutely surreal, but it was surreal. Do you remember that? Oh, it's incredible. It's amazing. I was just thinking today, when I see tourists standing with a couple of cops, and a cop trying his best to speak broken English with the map, and, and I can remember when you, the last thing you wanted was to attract the notice of a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> you would never think of going to them for help. For yeah, help. And yeah. You just didn't want to, you didn't get angry because you didn't want to stand out because if you stood out, you just never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Really, anything could happen. Yeah, it, there was a lot of fear. And of course, what happened there is happened in Canada and the States too, I think. When there was any political trouble, it was always people from outside who'd started it. Yeah. So that here, it wouldn't have ever been a Spaniard, you know. Uh, it was people from outside who were doing it. If they would just calm down and keep out of the way, there'd be no problems, you know? <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Another thing I want to ask you, I think I asked you about this some time ago. I have this memory, which is probably a false memory, that in this little plaza down here, that I can remember seeing people typing letters for money for other people. Oh no, they did it in the La Gardunia. La Gardunia. Yeah, yeah. They, no, no. That. They that were, they were, they were scribes. People who, because there were enough people, people who could didn't. read and write. Yeah. Exactly. They would come and they would dictate, and they were immigrants from the south, I suppose, of Spain. Or or people, or people, ordinary people who from, from never, just never, never, never had, to had, to never had yeah. any ed education. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was the thing. They were here until probably ten or fifteen years ago, uh, on, in the path that go down. There was about six booths, little booths, cubby holes, uh, and people would type a letter for you. Oh my God! We have seen so many changes when we first came here to this apartment. Oh, you know all the stuff you know with getting our things that were sent from Canada and and getting all our papers in order. You remember what it was like, the bureaucracy. I mean, it took forever, forever. But we had to go, and we still have this paper somewhere, to... The uh, Alcalde del, del Barrio. Yeah. So we lived uh, on the so top little of a building old street, you in, know. In, uh, in part of this uh, neighborhood. And, um, and he it, had to give us a written thing to say that we had registered with him. I mean, it was something that was, it was not legal. I'm it, sure it was not. No, it was perfectly legal, but it was from the Middle Ages. And yeah. unfortunately, it has taken a lot of time to get rid of a lot of things. Now, I must be positive. The, the, there are moves now to, to try to have, you know, uh, the public being attended to at one window, a single window, as they call it. So that you just have to go to one place to put in any paper related to uh, your communication with the government at any level. Uh, that is a very big step uh, because that, that is something I, I, I feel that they should be congratulated on because that uh, is a total change of mentality. And it's a bit like this whole thing that I was mentioning before. The legal system is outdated. It has taken six years to go through the pre-trial process for Hescatera, uh, um, which was a pyramid scheme, which uh, uh, took the money from a whole lot of people and uh, they will never get it back. But it has taken the legal system six years to bring those people to trial. Now that doesn't make any sense to me in, in, in any country uh, of the world uh, th that it would take so, such a long period of time. I mean, a lot of the people who were, whose money was robbed uh, are probably dead or in, in a different situation. And that uh, to me is something that really the, the, the de democratic system here should now tackle. And, the, you know, and there are others you could bring up. I must say that there have been, as I said, advances and some not such big advances. But we, we, this, is, this is life. You can't expect everything to be fixed up in, a, in one day. I don't know. When people talk about, about the law, they say it's because it's based on Roman law. 
Actually, they say in Italy it's worse. The bureaucracy, I don't know if that's still so. That was said a few years ago. Probably on Greek law. <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Or whatever. But it's amazing that they had a, uh, on Alcalde de Barrio. Oh, no, that was, and uh, we still have that paper because it, it seems like something was like really precious. And I remember the day that, that we went up the afternoon, and it was just a, a little, he was just an ordinary guy living in his little apartment. It was all very officious, though, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With a stamp. Yeah. 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 I forget what we needed that for, but that was certainly one thing in the step, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. in the uh -huh. step that uh -huh. we had to go through. And when Tararias came back, were you here? No, not, that, that that moment. not at that moment. I think we came back a few months later. later. Yeah. yeah. No, we but weren't But it was here. an exciting time. That was better and we were sort of well aware of it. But that, no, I would love to have been here for that. Uh, the the, the, the things that that reminds me of are the, the first, you know, on say the September and, and the first of first of May, those demonstrations. They the, were they were landmarks. They were landmarks and, and the feeling from people just to, you know, yeah. it was it was marvelous. It was marvelous, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, those things I mean that that uh, you know, now I mean it it's interesting after such a short time how many of us have become very lax about celebrating those things. But when you realize that for years and years you haven't been allowed to celebrate them, they're very special. No, there, there was such a... I think one of the things that, that makes it different from now is that now, as a society perhaps, we've become a bit cynical again. Huh? And then there was no cynicism. Uh, then we really believed. We yeah. believed that... Because remember the change largely... Well, largely, I guess there were lots of factors. But I always feel now that perhaps the political parties now are losing this. They don't remember that it was the, the Comisiones de, de Barrios, Las Asociaciones de Vecinos, the, and the clandestine unions in small little cells that started to complain about broken windows, about not having decent toilets, about uh, things that they couldn't do in the barrio. Huh? Things that don't seem very important, and yet they were able to complain about those, and it was very difficult to pretend that they were political things, and they, they insisted, and they made so much noise, that they gradually got that, and they got bigger, and asked for more things, and more things, and more things, and then all those little groups together all over the country. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what politics is, not just a party or parties deciding, and I wonder if we're not getting away from that again. You know, that involvement of people so that that we're all there and it's important to us, because it is important yeah, to us. Right. Well, we've certainly seen, I mean, the, the idea of breaking up neighborhoods is, and, and that sort of sense, feelings uh, goes on, so it's gone on in the States and in Canada. And I was, I was talking to somebody this morning, we were doing another interview, and I was remembering that when I first came here, the Serenos. Oh, they were wonderful. <laughs> they were wonderful. And you'd come home, you'd forget your keys, and 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 there and they they'd come and they uh, yeah that was a that, that was a very different thing to us that was another, too, that was another. Yeah, all night I mean a certain sense of security uh, but Re a neighborhood generated yeah, security exactly you know? exactly but this, is, this is one of the things we don't seem to be able to do now one of the things that troubles me not because of the the cost but one of the things that troubles me is the graffiti. In the, in the metro, for example. And usually it's not graffiti, it's uh, scratching the windows. Now, uh, this has been a fairly common thing. It happened in New York, for example. But uh, one of the things that this uh, uh, encourages is uh, more uh, actions of the same kind. And, and it, it, I think we, we've sort of lost or we're losing that feeling that we have to buy 
we have to pay for those the metro windows, all of us, with our tickets and with our taxes and so forth. And it seems to me that we, we need to uh, uh, try to teach people how to behave. And I think this idea of, of introducing a, another subject in the schools about living together, convivente as they call it, is an excellent idea because uh, the, 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 we have to pay for those, the, the damage to, to the metro trains and so I forth. think people just need to, to be made to feel that, that we all belong. Yeah. That like Catalonia, Spain isn't just a thing. I mean, it's only there because we're here. Mm -hmm. huh? That's right. That's, it's all of us. In, in those years, like after the transition, what was, was, I imagine you guys participated quite a bit in the art and cultural life, and I assume there was a real strong renaissance of, oh, uh, oh, of everything. Although I always remember Jose Maria Valverde saying that he always imagined that uh, uh, after the transition, after the, the dictatorship, that there'd be writers all over the place with books, you know, in there, hidden in their drawers that would all suddenly come out, and that didn't happen. That didn't happen. There wasn't necessarily that, but I mean, gradually with time, then people did, you know, things were produced. And but I imagine that that is a reflection of, of the fear <coughs> and, the, and the general uh, depressing uh, society that they were living in because uh, it's, it's easy to understand that, uh, that even the most creative people were affected by all that. That's right. Now, I remember uh, sort of for me the end date in this, in this looking at the transition and I was here on it was February 23rd 1981 uh, when Tejero came into the halls of Congress uh, and I, and for me there, I, I was tremendously moved. I never had anything else like it happen to me by it. It was the only time that I ever really understood what it was like in the worst part of the dictatorship because the reaction of the people when it happened was just uh, shocking. I mean, people were moved on such a deep and profound level of, of, of terror that it was going to happen again. Where were, you, where were you guys when that happened? Well, David was shooting a film in Canada and I had gone and I was, we were at the airport, I was coming back, Miguel was here. And uh, we talked by phone and everything, each day. And suddenly, we're in the lineup, it was about eight o'clock at night at the airport, and uh, Allegra, our daughter, was with us, and she came back, and she had a paper. A newspaper. A newspaper. And it said that it, what had happened, I can't tell you, it was, well, fear, shock. We had our son here. Was I going to be able to get in? And anyway, David and Allegra said, perhaps, you know, you should wait until tomorrow because you don't know. The airports had been closed. They were closed at that point. I had to go through London. And I thought, no. No, no, at least I have to get as close as I can and keep getting in because Miguel was here. That, it was shocking. It was shocking. I can remember being on the plane to London and as we were just about to, to land at Heathrow, there was a man sitting beside me and he said, forgive my uh, speaking to you, he said, but he said, since you got on this plane hours ago, he said, you've been sitting there like a zombie. He said, you, you haven't moved. Are you aware of that? And I told him, uh, you know, I hadn't been aware of it, but I, I, I realized why it was so. Anyway, I was able, the, the airports were open. I was able to get the flight in. And by then, of course, the thing had all been to a degree resolved, no? But... Uh, that was scary. That was scary. It's interesting, people have often asked me after that, what would have happened? Would you have stayed had it not worked out the way it worked out? And I would have. I guess, I guess that was the point that I knew 
to what degree then this was part of me and I was part of it. I've often felt, I've often said that I wonder if uh, I would feel so much a part of the country when a great deal of my life has been lived outside of Spain. I was born in Australia. Uh, uh, I only came here first as a teenager. I was 18, 19 when I first came. Um, there were always close ties with the family, even before that. But And then we lived a number of years in Canada. But I think the fact that we'd worked so directly as part of the change made us feel, well, I guess I can only really talk for myself, but that, like this, this mm. is my home. Mm. And David, had you come before you came here with Gloria, or not? Yes, we came together. But that was your first time in the... Well, our first time uh, was in 1954. Mm. We came to Barcelona. We, we yeah. came uh, to Asturias first of all, and then went to, through Madrid to Barcelona. And, um, and there were very close friends of my, of my family um, who lived here then, who became like a family for us. My grandfather, who was living in Australia then, who was 40 at the time of the war, came back came back and was eventually uh, injured and managed to get out again. But uh, a family here, well not family, they were friends, very close friends then who had helped him at that point. When we came back were like family to us. But he was uh, a, 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 a member of the Australian contingent. Well, he came as a member of, and, of the Australian contingent, and then and then once he got here, he transferred to the the Republican Army. But but he was actually a member of the Australian uh, International Brigades. Interesting, because in Australia, it's getting a bit away from the transition. But in Australia, we we um, we lived when I was a, a child growing up in a small town in the cane growing area in north in northeast uh, Australia and Queensland. And uh, I was asked to speak at a conference at the University of Barcelona three or four years ago. Uh, it was had been organized by Australian studies. And I think of the 23 papers that were given, three or four of them, at least three of them, that I remember now, mentioned my family and the, the town where we were. And that, to me, was then absolutely a revelation. But apparently, in that town, my, when my grandfather came back, my grandmother had a committee of help to the Spanish Republic. And in that tiny town, they earned, they, they managed to collect more money than, than in other committees in Sydney and Melbourne. So it was in the blood. <laughs> Interesting, though. Eh? So the ties do go back a long time. It's not just romanticism, eh? Yeah. I don't know if there's anything more we can add that might be. It's good. Yeah. It's, great. it's interesting, isn't it? But a lot of things we do forget, don't we? Because that's yeah, we like don't. 30 years ago well, now. You know, it's hard to remember how daily life was so different. You yeah. Know, until you start to remember a detail of, of your life. Of things, yeah. Days, you know? yeah. You start to remember these guys over here writing letters for people, or you start to remember how much it costs to get bread, or how yeah. many stores that are not here anymore. Isn't or, that the thing? That that's know, yeah. All but, the little stores are gone. It was a town of little... But you know, even in those first years, not only a, lo a lot of those stores gone, but there were incidents, eh? Like still, when people used to get together to, to dance sardanas, eh? very often you'd have uh, the police all around them, you know, waiting in case there was uh, an incident. I can remember when we came home one night, from Leitana, we came through the Plaza de, de la Catedral, and in one of those buildings that isn't there anymore, 
a sort of a, a lower building than what they built now. There were police on, on top. I mean, it wasn't unusual to be in incidents where there were police with rubber bullets and things. It, it's funny, we accepted all of that as part of the change and now often we forget that that was all part of the change. Yeah. Anyway, here we are and we're able to sit and talk about it. Right? And that's all <laughs> on, on camera. Oh, definitely. Good. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. Okay. We'll have a, at some point we'll organize.